also a research assistant in the Cognition and Action Lab. And also, like Jenny, I'm going to be looking at how we're trying to understand how students perform and what are actions. And the title of my talk is Developing a Model of the Basic Gang in the Cerebellum. And I chose this talk title because this is essentially what I've set out to do. So a useful framework for thinking about motor actions is that actions are composed of both selection and execution, execution processes. And to make this a bit more concrete, I'm using the example of playing tennis. It is a motor lab, after all. And so when playing tennis, your most immediate motor goal is to return your opponent's shot back from their side of the court. And we can think of this action of returning the shot as being composed of first a selection process. Do I pick a forehand plan or do I pick a backhand? And then an execution process, actually swinging the racket and executing the stroke. An important thing to consider within this framework is when you have an error in your action, so say you hit the ball into the net, this error can be a source of either an error in your selection system, maybe you force a back end when you should have hit a forehand, or an error in your execution system, maybe you took your eye off the ball, and so on. And our question is, you know, what we're interested in investing with this model is how does the brain know which of these two systems caused the error? And so how does it know then which system needs to improve on, on the, in the future? If we're going to understand how the brain um, uh, solves this problem, we need to understand a bit more about how the brain implements these two processes. And so the two brain structures thought to be important for action selection and execution respectively are the basal ganglia, structure picture in the center, important for selection, and the cerebellum structure picture in the bottom right, important for execution. And so we can think of this overall model of the basal ganglia and cerebellum as being composed of two simpler submodels. And the first is this basal ganglia selection model. In order to understand how it works a bit better, we can run it through our test example. So this basal ganglia first takes in some indicator that the action should be initiated. So in tennis, this is just when the ball comes at you, that means you should hit it back. And then it makes some selection, and we're going to use a forehand or backhand. And then this selection results in some reward. So you can think of a positive reward as you hit the ball back into the other side of the court, or a negative reward as you miss the shot and you hit it into the net. And the way the system's learned, we can investigate that by looking at this example. So let's say that your basal ganglia selected a forehand. And this results in you getting the ball back to the other side of the court. Well, this positive reward is positive reinforcing, and so it's going to make you more likely to select that forehand again in the future. In contrast, if you miss the shot, this is a negative reward. That negative reward is negative reinforcing, and it's going to make you less likely to pick that forehand in the future. So the system, through trial and error, learns to select actions that lead to positive rewards and avoid actions that lead to negative rewards. So on the other hand, we have this other submodel, this cerebellum execution model. And this cerebellum execution model takes in some selection, so select the forward or back end in the test example, then it actually performs the swing, and this leads to some outcome. You can think of a good outcome as this performed swing matches some internal desired swing. So if the system performs the swing that's trying to swing, uh, performs the swing that's trying to perform, this is a good outcome, and the system is working as it should. However, a negative outcome occurs when this perform swing does not match that desired swing. So you made some error, and this error we're calling execution error. And so this is how the system knows it needs to improve that, improve itself in the future and work on its swing. And so we've talked about this basal gang of selection model now and this cerebellum execution model, kind of these two independent systems. And indeed, traditionally, these two systems have been studied and modeled largely independently of one another. But if we think of them as purely independent, we start to run into some problems. So consider the following example. Let's say that you're playing tennis again, and you miss your shot into the net. And let's say you missed the shot because you made a clear error in your execution, but the selection you made was, was correct. Well, if you look at what our models do in this case, the cerebellum model is going to see that execution error. It's going to be like, I messed up. I need to work on my system. This is good. The basic data selection model, however, is going to see that negative reward. It's going to see it hit the net and be like, uh oh, something bad happened. I should negative reinforce the selection I made. We know this is a problem though because the selection it made was fine. The error was really a consequence of the execution system. And so we need some way for this execution system to be able to tell the selection system, hey, don't punish the selection you made. That was my bad. I need to work on my system. You're doing fine. And to think if these two systems are going to communicate, maybe there's some way that these two structures in the brain communicate. Indeed, recent synaptic tracing studies have found a connection from the cerebellum to the basic ganglion in the brain. And this has motivated a hypothesis for how the brain might solve this problem using this connection. And specifically, that hypothesis is that execution error is sent along this connection from the cerebellum to the basal ganglia, and it's used to stop that name reinforcement when we have a missed shot. 
So now when you get this neighbor board and you know it was caused by execution system, the execution system has a way to tell the selection system, don't punish the selection you made, it was actually okay. So I've been using this tennis example to kind of motivate the hypothesis, and I'm not claiming that my model can play tennis by any means. What I'm really interested in investigating is, you know, how the brain might solve this problem of assigning error between the two systems. So what we need to see is, can we find support for this hypothesis in a controlled experimental setting? And we've had that some support, some evidence for that this hypothesis, and I'll show that the model, if by implementing this hypothesis, can actually account for those behavioral results. So the first task we designed was a simple selection task in which execution is relevant. So this is just looking at people's baseline selection without any execution becoming into play. And so at the beginning of every trial, persons are shown the screen, and they press either the left or right keyboard key to select between the right and left targets, your picture here is red squares. And one of these options is always a safe option, so this means that you have a higher probability of getting points from this target, but the points that you do get are going to be lower value on average. The other option is a risky option, which you have a low probability of getting points, but those points are going to be higher on average. And so persons are told, get as many points as you can, and what we're interested in is do people pick this safe option more on, on average, or do they pick this risky option more on average as they go through this experiment. And so then we can think every time they make this selection, you can either have a hit trial, so this is where they receive the points, this is their positive reward, they receive points between 0 and 100, or a mistrial where the target breaks, so this is you know, an error in your selection, you selected a bad target, and persons receive no points, and this is your negative reward. So that safe target is more likely to give you this hit trial, whereas this risky target is more likely to give you this mistrial. And if we run through this experiment through the model, what we find is that this model predicts that people will choose that safe option more. So we can step through this experiment just like we did with our tennis example. What we find is that indicate, the indicator for the action to start is just when those targets appear. And then the basal game that makes some selection, now that selection is either I'm going to pick the risky or the safe target. And this selection results in some reward. So in the hit trial, this is your positive reward, it's positive reinforcing. The missed trial is your negative reward, and it's negative reinforcing. And so we can compare the safe target and risky target in the system. And what we find is that the safe target, remember, it's more likely to give you a hit, so it's more likely to be positive reinforced. So we expect the system to be more likely to select in the future. In contrast, that risky target is more likely to give you a miss, so it's going to be negative reinforced and thus less likely for the system to select again in the future. So this combination of positive reinforcement of that safe target and this negative reinforcement of that risky target is going to lead the model to prefer that safe target more on average. And so now we have to ask the question, well, what do people actually do? And it turns out people produce the same safe bias. So we quantify this by taking the number of times they reach the safe target minus the number of times they reach the risky target. We see a clear positive safe bias in human subjects, and also in the model in blue here when we actually simulate the model on the experimental task. So this is interesting, right? Um, but it's by no means a novel finding. Uh, participants are clearly risk averse and are treating this safe option, but this is actually a pretty famous finding in the economic decision making literature. And remember, what we're really interested in investigating is not whether people are gamblers or not, but what role does execution system have on the selection process? So what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce a non-trivial execution system. So we're taking those left and right keyboard presses, and we're replacing them now with center outreaches, very similar to the setup Jenny talked about in her experiment. So people are reaching, and this cursor on the screen now tracks their reaches. And so this task is now the same, but in order to reach to one of the two targets, you have to, in order to select between the two targets, you have to reach out to the target instead of just press the keyboard key. And this introduces the possibility for people to make errors in their execution. So now we can look again at our hit versus miss trial. And we see that our hit trial, again, is when you receive points. But now this hit trial appears to be contingent on whether you reach to the target correctly. In contrast, a mistrial now seems to be caused by an execution error. So when you reach and your cursor does not intersect the target, now you don't get any points. So this negative reward appears to be dependent on you executing this reach correctly. All right, so it's important that participants believe that when they missed, it's because they made an execution error. In reality, this task is actually identical to the keyboard task in every way. And that and is identical to the keyboard task in that hit or miss trials are pre-computed in the exact same fashion. So what we can say is, so say that this trial was determined to be a hit, a uh, missed trial, and say that the participants, though, when they reached the target, they actually hit the target. So the green is where their reach actually ended up, 
Well, since it was supposed to be a mistrial, the feedback we actually give them, we pan outside of the target. And this difference is small if the participants are unaware of this manipulation. So what we've done is we recreate this keyboard task, but now we make participants believe that when they get a negative reward, it's due to their execution error and not due to the selection they're making. So we can run this new task through, we can run this new task through our model again, and the selection system looks largely the same. So again, you know, this target appears, that's the indication you select between the two. You make this selection, risk your safe, and you can get a positive reinforcing hit or a negative reinforcing miss. But now it's different, it's according to our hypothesis. We now have this execution system sending over that execution error. So anytime you have a mistrial, the execution error is now stopping that negative reinforcement. So you're no longer punishing your selection every time you don't get points when you reach to a target. So now what we can do is we can compare our, this safe versus risky target to just this positive reinforcement pathway. And remember the safe target, when it gives you points, it gives you much lower value points, whereas the risky target gives you much higher value points. So what we expect is this safe target to be somewhat positive reinforced, but this risky target to be much more positive reinforced. And so now we expect the model now the model predicts that people are going to choose that risky target more on average, so they're going to flip the bias. And again, the real question is, is this what people actually do? Short answer is yes. So now we can look at that same number of safe choices minus the number of risky choices, and the participants in green here have clearly flipped their bias to pick that risky target more often. And the model, when actually simulating that experiment, also flipped its bias as predicted. And so, um, We've sh you know, I've shown this model, and the idea is we have this you know, problem. We, we, you know, it's pretty intuitive how people solve this problem. What we're interested in is how does the brain actually do what people do to solve this problem? And so I, we came up with this hypothesis, and we showed that this hypothesis both supported this, uh, this behavioral evidence. And then we also, um, by implementing the hypothesis in the model, we showed that in a biological system, this hypothesis can account for those behavioral results. So I want to end with a few thank yous. I want to thank my Faculty advisor, Professor Richard Ivory, and media supervisor and lab, Dr. Matthew Crossley, for all their time and support throughout this process. I also want to thank the surf donors and staff for making this program possible, and thank you for listening today. And then over time, they kind of, you know, the system learns that, oh, this target's, you know, more likely to hit and you need lower points and so on. So they're not explicitly told that, no. And then were you saying that what happened was the time that it would have gotten a miss, it got an execution error instead? Yeah, so when we have the reaching task, so say you're doing this task right, and, you know, you're reaching and people aren't aware that we're going to mess with you. They don't know that we can control the screen. So they're thinking, hey, this target's giving me greater points. If I can just get this reach done, I'm gonna get way more points. Mm -hmm. And so the way that this works in the model is the model just says, hey, I had an execution error. I should not select that target. The target's gonna give me more points. So um, yeah, that's the kind of the intuitive. So it makes a lot of sense intuitively. And we show that by having this connection between the brain to solve uh, service purpose, you can get that same. Was the execution error? Yeah. Um, so that was all predetermined. So basically, there's the frequency of mistrials. And I didn't go into much detail. So there's, it's actually pretty complicated how those are computed. And so there's um, actual predefined functions. And so it's not like one target's a safe option, the other target's a risk option. They're actually constantly flipping. So sometimes they're kind of equivalent. But on an average, one of the targets is always safer, and one of the other targets is always riskier. So you can think the risky target's going to have. Um, a much higher chance of being a miss on every target. So it depends on which target and it changes throughout the experiment. But, yeah. Um, if the targets change throughout the experiment, how will the user ever learn what is the safe one and what is the risky one? Like they won't have the, like how, how, how will that then test their selection? Because they don't know what they're doing. So they uh, we do a lot of trials. So people do this a lot and they can actually track the target. So if the risk chart's on the right, they'll start reaching to it to the right and then it'll slowly switch, and we'll see people will slowly switch to the left. So that overall bias is kind of the fact that we're not taking the number of times they reach the right target or the number of times they reach the left target. We're taking the number of times they reach the target that at the current trial is risky, per se. So people can actually track it surprisingly for that. So it's not, um, yeah, it's kind of surprising. That was a small question. Uh, so how does the prefrontal cortex do all that? Because 
because I come from a not much of a learning literature and everything that has to do with reward and risk taking is usually totally different from what this. So yeah. Um, so you know, there's this by no means is you know, Paul is it the solution to this yeah. problem. But um, the work I've done mostly is focused on bit game and so we've been just kind of looking at it as like this implicit process. And we show that just a simple selection system and execution system can be um, can account for that. So another source for that value, so between the stars can be the true of course. Yeah. So that's like another so within this um, experiment, that's like another hypothesis for how this works. Yeah, so no, like basically the hypothesis works, but the regions that yeah. do it, it's not really clear that it would be actually yeah. the best thing there or the yeah, or, yeah. Or yeah. The idea here is it's simple enough to even like a simple, you know, just reinforcement 